It crossed the sound barrier twice before you even heard it coming. Impressive. Well, here's the thing that nobody tells you. It's basically a flying death trap, held together by engineering prayers and pilot discipline. Because when you strap rockets to wings and call it progress, physics has a nasty habit of reminding you who's really in charge. This is the story of how America's faster is better obsession nearly killed air combat one overpriced lawn dart at a time. Meet John Boyd, Air Force fighter pilot, tactical genius, and the guy who basically told the entire military industrial complex that they were building flying coffins. Boyd earned the nickname 42nd Boyd because he had a standing bet. He could beat any pilot in air to air combat training within 40 seconds, or he'd pay them $40. He never lost, he never had to pay. In the 1960s, while everyone was obsessing over building jets that could outrun their own shadows, Boyd was asking an uncomfortable question. What good is speed if you can't turn without ripping your wings off? Boyd had noticed something troubling during the Vietnam War. American jets like the F-105 Thunder Chief and the infamous F-111 Aardvark were engineering marvels massive, fast, and packed with enough electronics to power a small city. The F-111 in particular was supposed to be the Swiss army knife of fighter jets, fast enough to outrun anything, tough enough to bomb anything, and sophisticated enough to do your taxes while dodging missiles. There was just one tiny problem. They weren't very effective in real-world combat. These were straight-line speedsters with the turning radius of a freight train and the fuel efficiency of a small country. The F-111, bless its swept-wing heart, could hit Mach 2.5 in a straight line, but needed roughly half of Texas to make a U-turn. These jets were built around low-bypass turbojet engines, basically controlled explosions that turned jet fuel into speed and noise in equal measure. They were powerful, sure, but they guzzled fuel like a teenager, drinks energy drinks, and had about as much finesse. When you're burning through your fuel supply faster than a Las Vegas wedding budget, you don't get to stay in the fight very long. The swept back wings that made these jets look so futuristic. They were great for punching through the sound barrier, but terrible for the kind of knife fight dogfighting that actually wins air battles. It's like bringing a drag racer to a go-kart track. Impressive specs, completely wrong tool. Boyd developed what he called energy maneuverability theory, which sounds fancy, but boils down to don't build jets that kill their own pilots. He figured out that what really mattered wasn't top speed. It was thrust to weight ratio and the ability to change vectors without becoming an unguided missile. Think of it this way. A jet is basically an engine with wings and those wings need to do more than just keep the engine from hitting the ground. They need to change direction and fast. The F-111's thrust to weight ratio was so poor that pilots joked it needed a running start to get off the ground. Meanwhile, Boyd was advocating for jets that could accelerate, climb, and turn like they actually wanted to survive combat. The problem with the faster is always better mentality was that it ignored a fundamental truth. In air combat, the guy who can point his nose at the enemy first usually wins. It doesn't matter if you can hit Mach 3 if you can't turn around to face the threat before it turns you into expensive confetti. Here's where physics gets really nasty. Those Mach 3 speeds that sound so impressive, they come with a side order of temperatures hot enough to melt lead. The SR-71 Blackbird, that beautiful speed demon, had to be built with special materials because regular aircraft metals would literally melt at those speeds. The fuel tanks leaked on the ground because the metal had to expand to seal properly at operating temperature. Now imagine trying to dogfight in that environment. You're not just managing speed and g-forces, you're managing a flying oven that wants to cook you alive while you're trying not to get shot down. The North Vietnamese didn't need to shoot down the F-111s. They just had to wait for them to either run out of fuel or melt their own engines. Here's a little private sector shout out. While military aviation was chasing Mach numbers like they were Pokemon cards, commercial aviation figured out a neat trick to advance jets for their own purposes decades ago. Modern airliners use high-bypass turbofan engines that are actually slower than their predecessors but much more efficient. A Boeing 707 from the 1960s could cruise at Mach 0.9, while today's 787 Dreamliner cruises at Mach 0.85. Slower, right? 
but the 787 uses 20% less fuel while carrying more passengers and greater comfort. Those massive, quiet engines you see on modern airliners are basically giant fans with a jet engine hidden inside. Most of the thrust comes from moving lots of air slowly rather than a little air very, very fast. The airlines figured out that getting there a few minutes later while using half the fuel was better business than arriving broke and deaf. Military aviation took a few more decades and several thousand crash jets to learn its lesson. Now, back to the fighters. Boyd didn't just complain about the problem. His energy maneuverability theory led to the creation of the two most successful fighter jets in history. First came the F-15 Eagle. The Air Force wanted a big, fast interceptor, loaded with fancy radar and missiles. Boyd fought to make it lighter, more maneuverable and capable of dogfighting. The result? A jet with an incredible thrust-to-weight ratio of over 1 to 1, meaning it could literally accelerate while climbing straight up. The F-15's party trick wasn't just speed. It was the ability to change vectors like a caffeinated hummingbird while maintaining energy. Boyd had proven that you could have your cake and eat it too. Be fast and maneuverable as long as you prioritize the right kind of speed at the right time. Boyd, along with Pierre Spray and others, formed the Fighter Mafia, an informal group within the Pentagon who challenged conventional wisdom on fighter design. While the F-15 turned out bigger and heavier than Boyd wanted, he still saw it as a major win because its core performance metrics followed his vision. The F-16 Fighting Falcon became a masterpiece by Boyd's standards, a lightweight fighter designed from the ground up around his principles. Forget the straight-line drag racers, this was a fighter pilot's fighter, excellent thrust-to-weight ratio, fly-by-wire controls that let pilots pull maneuvers that would have torn the wings off earlier jets, and fuel efficiency that meant it could actually stay in the fight. Both jets became legendary not because they were the fastest things in the sky, but because they could actually fight and win. The F-15 went decades without losing an air-to-air -air combat, while the F-16 became one of the most successful fighter designs in history. Boyd had proven his point with mathematical precision. In air combat, it's not about how fast you can go in a straight line. It's about how quickly you can change your mind and point your weapons at the other guy. Today's fighters like the F-22 Raptor and F-35. Lightning II represent a more mature understanding of speed. They can go fast when they need to, but they're designed to be effective at multiple speeds and altitudes. The F-22 can super cruise, maintain supersonic speeds without afterburners, which gives it the efficiency Boyd was looking for. These modern jets use advanced flight control systems that prevent pilots from accidentally ripping their own wings off, because apparently, don't destroy your own aircraft needed to be programmed into the computer. They also manage thrust vectoring, the ability to point the engine exhaust in different directions, which gives them maneuverability that would make Boyd proud. The fifth generation fighters, your F-22s, F-35s, and their international cousins, represent Boyd's philosophy taken to its logical conclusion. These jets don't chase maximum speed like their Cold War ancestors. They treat speed as just one tool in a much larger toolbox. Take the F-22 Raptor. Sure, it can hit Mach 2.25 when it needs to, but its real party trick is Super Cruise, cruising at Mach 1.5 without afterburners. This isn't about going fast to look cool, it's about energy management. Super Cruise means you can maintain high speed without the massive fuel consumption and heat signature of afterburners. You stay fast, stay efficient, and stay hidden. The F-35 Lightning II is a bit of a different animal. It's not the fastest jet in the sky, maxing out around Mach 1.6, but it doesn't need to be. Instead, it's optimized for stealth, sensor fusion, and situational awareness. The F-35's philosophy is simple. Why outrun the enemy when you can see them first, shoot first, and never let them know you were there? But America wasn't the only country learning Boyd's lessons. The Russians developed the Su-27 family, which took energy maneuverability theory and added some distinctly Russian flair. The Su-27 and its variants like the Su-35 are massive jets with incredible thrust-to-weight ratios and the ability to perform maneuvers that seem to violate the laws of physics. The famous Cobra maneuver, where the jet essentially stops mid-air and points its nose straight up, is pure Boyd theory in action, using energy management to gain a tactical advantage. The Russians also gave us the MiG-29, their answer to the F-16, lightweight, agile, and built around the idea that air combat happens in the merge, not at maximum range. Soviet pilots didn't have the luxury of perfect maintenance and unlimited fuel. 
so they built jets that could fight and win in the first few minutes of combat. European manufacturers took a different approach with jets like the Eurofighter Typhoon and the French Rafale. These jets represent a compromise between American stealth obsession and Russian maneuverability focus. The Typhoon can supercruise like the F-22, but emphasizes agility over stealth. The Rafale is France's answer to multi-role flexibility, not the fastest jet in the sky, but capable of doing everything from air superiority to nuclear strike. Even the Swedish got in on the act with the Gripen, a lightweight fighter that's basically Boyd's dream machine. Small, agile, fuel efficient, and designed to operate from highway strips because Sweden figured that airports would be the first things to get bombed in a real war. The Gripen proves that you don't need to be the biggest or fastest. You just need to be smart about how you use your energy. Now we're entering the sixth generation era and speed is becoming even less important. The American Next Generation Air Dominance NGAD program, the British Tempest, and the European Future Combat Air System FCAS, are all moving beyond the traditional fighter paradigm entirely. These aren't just fast jets with better computers, they're airborne battle managers designed to coordinate with drones, satellites, and ground forces in real time. The sixth generation philosophy is that the lone wolf fighter pilot is dead. Future air combat will be about controlling swarms of unmanned aircraft while staying far enough away to avoid getting shot down. Speed? Still important, but not in the way you think. These jets will need to be fast enough to get where they're needed, but their real advantage will be in networking, artificial intelligence, and the ability to control multiple combat drones simultaneously. It's like having a quarterback who can throw to a dozen receivers at once while staying in the pocket. The Chinese are developing their own sixth generation concepts with projects like the mysterious aircraft spotted at their test facilities. The Russians are working on the Su-75 Checkmate and other advanced programs. Everyone has learned Boyd's lesson. Raw speed is useless if you can't apply it intelligently. Here's the beautiful irony. We've come full circle to Boyd's original insight. The fastest jets in the sky are increasingly unmanned drones that can pull G-forces that would turn human pilots into pudding. The QF-16 drone can outmaneuver any human pilot because it doesn't have to worry about keeping its operator conscious. Meanwhile, the manned fighters are becoming battle management platforms that coordinate these unmanned assets. The human pilot's job isn't to be the fastest gun in the sky, it's to be the smartest. Speed has finally taken its proper place as just one component of a much more complex equation. Modern air combat validates everything John Boyd argued for decades ago. The F-22 and F-35 don't need to be the fastest jets ever built because they're designed around energy management, situational awareness, and the ability to engage threats on their own terms. They can be fast when they need to be, efficient when they need to conserve fuel, and maneuverable when they need to fight. The lesson extends beyond just American jets. Whether it's a Swedish Gripen operating from a highway strip, a Russian Su-35 performing impossible aerobatics, or a European Typhoon supercruising across the North Sea, modern fighters all embody Boyd's core insight. It's not about maximum speed, it's about having the right speed at the right time for the right mission. The cautionary tale here isn't just about jets, it's about the danger of optimizing for the wrong metric. The F-111 was a masterpiece of engineering that was completely wrong for its intended mission. It was like building the world's fastest hammer when what you really needed was a screwdriver. When speed becomes your only goal, you end up with jets that can outrun their own mistakes but can't survive long enough to make them. The Vietnam War taught us that a slow, maneuverable jet that can stay in the fight is worth 10 fast jets that have to run home to refuel after 5 minutes of combat. Boyd's legacy lives on in modern fighter design. The understanding that air combat is about energy management, not just raw speed. It's about having the right amount of speed at the right time, not maximum speed all the time. The irony is delicious. In our quest to build the fastest jets possible, we nearly forgot how to build jets that could actually fight and win. Sometimes the tortoise really does beat the hare, especially when the hare runs out of fuel halfway through the race and crashes into a tree. And as we move into an era where some of the most dangerous things in the sky may not even have pilots, Boyd's wisdom becomes even more relevant. Whether you're designing a sixth generation fighter or a combat drone, the same principles apply. Speed is just energy and energy is only useful if you can manage it intelligently. This is Steel Mallard. Subscribe, leave a comment, and stay fast. Just don't forget to maneuver.